Did you know that YouTube is the second biggest search engine in the US? So what can you do to bring your organization's videos to the top of the search results page? Our very own Daniel Titmus will give you tips and advice on platform-specific keyword research, optimizing your channel and playlist for searchability, and more. There will be a Q&A for this session, so please post your questions in the session chat. At the end of the stream, please stick around for our final refreshing stretch break with Akua Noni Parker. Daniel, the search is over. You found us and we're ready for you. Hi everyone, my name is Dan Titmus. I'm a white male with brown hair, blue eyes, glasses, and I'm wearing a blue shirt. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm speaking to you from Astoria in New York, which is on the traditional lands of the Munsi Lenape people. Okay, so I will admit something. I am kind of a, like an obsessive person. I go through little obsessions on a regular basis. Uh, those of you who know me will be unsurprised to know that in college, I really got into a close-up magic um, to my embarrassment. Uh, and a few months ago, it was Game of Thrones fan theories. I've always been like a big fan of Game of Thrones, but I really went down the rabbit hole in like these intricate fan theories, reading the books and listening to long-running Game of Thrones podcasts. But as of the last few weeks, my obsession has been fresh pasta. Uh, over the last few weeks, I've made like tens of different types of pasta, all different like types from tagliatelle to cavatelli to my new favorite, which is this one, garganelli. This one's kind of like um, penne with like overlaps and big ridges that makes it slightly chewier. Uh, it's one of the best pastas you can have for thick, like tomato-based sauces. It's delicious. Um, though, even though I've made all of this pasta, I've never once read a book or taken a class on how to make pasta from scratch. I've learned everything from YouTube. Fun fact, a billion hours of YouTube are watched every day. Billion with a B. That can really be a very difficult thing to put into perspective. Um, so... Think about it like this, 74% of adults in the USA are on YouTube. And we learned from the Ticket Bias um, study before that 90% of your patrons are using YouTube at some point in the week. Look to your left, look to your right. Most of you are at home with nobody watching you, but if you were watching this in a lecture theater, the people who you would be sitting next to will probably be using YouTube at some point. Uh, let's have a little chat about the agenda here. So first we're gonna look at what is a search engine and what makes up a search engine's business model. We're gonna talk about the types of video that you might have on your YouTube channel. Then we're gonna look at some keyword research um, and then optimizations that you can make to your YouTube videos to make sure they appear on the search engine results page, the SERP for YouTube. We're gonna talk about your content and how it needs to be like, good. Um, we're going to talk about organizing the content you have, and then we're also going to bring in Google to talk about a, first, a search first approach. You know, YouTube is not just a place to watch fun videos of cats. Like it is a place to watch fun videos of cats, but it's also the second biggest search engine in the United States. This is really interesting, like thinking of YouTube this way, because we don't typically think about it as a search engine. Like, what is a search engine? The Webster's English Dictionary defines, I'm just kidding. A search engine is anything that looks through a list of entries to give you a list of results. Of course, the most famous of these is Google, but they are actually everywhere. And I've got a secret to let you know. Uh, most search engines are not nonprofits. They aren't doing this out of the good of their heart. And search engines, they exist to help companies make money. And to really understand why a search engine exists and how to optimize towards that search engine, we need to start thinking about search engines in this light because there's a lot of money in search engines. There's a study done in the Netherlands that used massive online choice experiments to measure the value that digital goods and services create. 
Internet search is the most valued category of digital goods. The median user would require compensation of $17,530 to forego search engines for a year. Uh, let's see what that means for Google and see how they make money. Well, when you type in a search into Google, they present you with a bunch of these organic search results. So if I type in best Broadway shows 2021, then I'm looking for these results, the organic results that keep people coming to Google. But that's not how they make money. They make money with the ad section at the top here. Um, they can only sell ads if people are using it as, the, as intended on the way on the the picture on the left here with the organic search results. So this is central to their business model. Right? They've got a lot of resources in trying to protect this. And it's in our best interest to play by their rules. Let's look at another search engine. You know, there are SEO professionals whose entire career focus is optimizing listings for the Amazon search engine. The Amazon search engine is central to their business model. You know, they want you to be able to find very specific items. It's in their best interest for you to find exactly what you're looking for. And so they reward uh, listings which give that information. For example, if someone was looking for a jokey, like Nicolas Cage themed gift for their friend, uh, they, Amazon can find you this very specific thing to buy, like this two foot high cardboard cutout of Academy Award winner Nicolas Cage, which was a gift to me and my wife. Um, it's in Amazon's best interest to give you the perfect gift here to make you find this very strange thing. Um, you know, here Amazon has delivered really strong results, relevant results. Uh, here we are with Nicolas Cage, the two foot high cardboard cutout at the Liberty Bell, all thanks to, thanks to Amazon's search engine. I was thinking about these people in this picture the other day, thinking, I wonder if they know that they're part of uh, Boot Camp 2021, along with Nicolas Cage. Um, you know, depending on what the search engine's business model is, we need to optimize towards different things. This is Uber Eats. Now, Uber Eats wants you to buy food, right? That's how they make their revenue. So they reward certain things that encourage that. High quality images, lower delivery times, and good reviews are all central to you to a search engine optimization on the Google Eats on the Uber Eats platform because these are the things that Uber Eats believes will encourage you to make that purchase. By understanding that, we can optimize towards these key metrics. So, what about YouTube? YouTube exists to sell ads. Um, when I'm looking for Game of Thrones fan theory videos like this one here. Um, side note, this, this YouTuber, Alt Shift X, did a breakdown of all the HBO um, trailers for Game of Thrones, which goes back to what Mark was saying before, like how much information they get inside those tiny little trailers. Um, but anyway, I, if I'm looking for these like videos, then I'm going to be served ads before that video plays. These ads are paid for by companies who want to drive sales. Uh, you know, YouTube's not bad at making that money, okay? Like, they generated $5 billion, with a B, uh, in advertising revenue in Q3 of 2020 alone. That's just Q3. So when you make a YouTube search, what are the things that YouTube really emphasizes? Well, after you make a search using the YouTube search engine, they want you to click through to that video so they can play that ad at the start. Like, that makes sense, right? If nothing on YouTube, the YouTube SERP, search engine results page, looks appealing, then a user's going to make a different search, go back to the homepage, or worst case scenario for YouTube, exit the platform. It's in their best interest to have what you're looking for, but that's not all. In general, YouTube wants to keep people watching for as long as possible. Session watch time, audience retention, these are some of YouTube's most important metrics. YouTube wants you to stay watching for as long as possible and watch multiple videos in a session. So we need to think about this when we're optimizing our videos for YouTube. Let's look at some of the videos that you might already have on YouTube and then think about some, some videos that you might not have at the moment. Firstly, trailers. Trailers are an amazing way to showcase upcoming seasons, shows, or even your organization as a whole. There's also full performances like concerts, plays, ballets, operas. Uh, these are becoming a more and more common resource on YouTube. Um, there's also behind the scenes, the show behind the show sort of thing, if you will, um, that are really, really popular. It can be a really great way of like letting people know about your organization. But this is a talk on search. And 
you know, a lot of the time, the things we talked about already, those last three aren't being searched as much, right? So let's, for, let's think about videos in the form of targeted videos. And what I mean by that is videos that are specifically created for YouTube, feeding into that YouTube search algorithm. Instead of creating a video first, uploading, and then uploading it, we're actually thinking about what people are typing into the search bar and either creating a video or optimizing a video based on that in this search first approach. We can create videos based on keyword research. Wait, what is keyword research? Well, the Webster's Dictionary defines keyword, I'm just kidding again. Keyword research is basically just how we decide what targeted video we want to make. Remember, we're looking at YouTube here as a search engine. So we need to make sure that we're creating videos that people are actually searching for. The first way we can use some of this keyword research is by optimizing the videos that are already on our channel. For example, if you have a full concert of Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata on your YouTube channel, what is the keyword that you should target? Is it piano sonata number 14? Do you optimize towards the term Moonlight Sonata concert or Moonlight Sonata live recording? All of this can be answered with keyword research where we can find a term that balances that sort of like the amount of volume um, and recognition that we have there. But we can also apply this to creating new videos. And this is, you know, arguably an even more powerful use of keyword research. You know, by undergoing keyword research, we can find keywords to inspire new content to upload. When we search from this search for, when we start from this search first approach um, in video creation, we can really lean into using YouTube, the second most used search engine in the United States, as an acquisition tool. Keyword selection needs to balance both competition and volume to find keywords that have a low enough competition to make them viable targets, but high enough volume to make them useful. We want to make sure that enough, pe enough people are searching for a phrase to make it worth targeting. Um, if we're not doing that, then, you know, we're not really looking at the YouTube algorithm when we're great, when we're uploading videos. Uh, you know, if we're creating a video from scratch in a search first approach, we want to make sure that people are searching for it. We also want to make sure it's not too competitive. If there are already a lot of organizations that are targeting this keyword and there's lots of people that are you know, already ranking pretty highly on the YouTube SERP for this, um, for this keyword, then it's going to be difficult for us to rank. And I realize at this point, like keyword research can get a little bit like dry and technical. Uh, and I wish I had like a puppy or something to show you to keep you interested, but I don't. That's a lie. By the way, I <laughs> this is a picture of my dad's new puppy, Barney. Uh, he's adorable. I've not met him yet because I've not been back to the UK in a couple of years. I just booked my ticket home for the holidays. Um, so yeah, anytime that the presentation is going to get a little bit too technical and uh, sort of like have that dry SEO sort of vibe, I'm going to show you a picture of Barney, the four-month-old Welsh Springer Spaniel. Um, okay, enough further ado. Let's start with the keyword research and a basic crash course on how to inspire content. And this basically comes in three parts. Inspiration, research, and selection. One of the most useful tools in keyword research is YouTube's autocomplete. You know, like Google's autocomplete, this gives suggestions of other things that people have already searched for that are associated with the search term that you type in. This is great, right? This is a direct insight into how people are searching for videos. And it gives us a clue as to what longer tail keywords could be an appropriate target. So here we're typing into the YouTube autocomplete piano tutorial. Um, all of these different searches here are you know, a really good insight into something, a video that could be created just for YouTube. You know, piano tutorial, Adele. We can create a, a piano tutorial based on Adele songs. Uh, piano tutorial, easy. You know, all of those can be used to inspire content. We can also use the Google autocomplete. The same logic applies here. We're getting a direct insight into what people are searching for. Both these both of these are great resources of inspiration. And you can see by looking at these auto-completed phrases, 
how these can be used in video in video creation. You know, creating a video of fastest dance styles or the most difficult dances or the easiest dance to complete for your wedding, whatever. Any of those could be used to really, you know, feed in to this autocomplete data. At the bottom of Google search engine results page, we can see uh, related searches, which aren't necessarily autocomplete stuff. Um, this is also a really, really good resource because it can show other things that are related to the search we're making. So wait, isn't this Google rather than YouTube? I hear you ask. Well, yes, it is. Um, and it's definitely worth considering that, but it's still a really, really useful resource. That's why you have to kind of use common sense when thinking about uh, keyword research, you know, after there's only so much that the data can do. If there's search data for directions to your organization uh, that's based on Google, it's unlikely that this is going to translate to YouTube, right? Because anyone searching for that is going to be looking at Google. But in the previous examples we were just looking at, both of those, all of those examples would feed in to make a decent video, YouTube, uh, decent video on YouTube. Needless to say, if the video doesn't make sense, don't make it. Answer the public is another really useful resource. Um, so with this site, it only allows you a small number of searches every day, uh, unless you shell out for the full version, but it allows you to put a subject into the search bar. I've just put in French painters here and gives you all of the questions that people ask on Google, as well as prepositions, comparisons and alphabeticals. So here we've got who are the French painters of the 19th century or French painters and sculptures, uh, sculptors, French painters in the Louvre. Like all of those are things that people have searched for. And it also gives alphabeticals here. This is like autocomplete for every letter of the alphabet. So who are the French painters, uh, like French painters, Napoleonic era, French painters, easel. Um, it's a really, really cool site. I sometimes just go on it just because it's interesting. Um, a lot of time what I do with keyword research is look at answer the public, those autocompletes that I mentioned before, um, you know, the suggested searches, a few other ideas that I had. And I basically just put all this into a tool which can tell me the search volume and competition for those keywords. Uh, there are a bunch of tools that you can pay for to make this happen. One of, the e one of them is super easy and super free, and that is the Keyword Planner. Keyword Planner can be found in your Google Ads account. It's a really, really useful tool because it allows you to look at historical metrics. You can upload that list of keywords that you have and look what is driving the most searches and then the competition associated with it. So you're looking for things that might have a low search, a low search competition, but a high monthly average search volume. Um, and just a reminder, we're really looking for stuff that has enough volume to make it worth it on YouTube. Uh, and this is, due, uh, this is data for Google, and it's also data for like Google, um, like paid Google data, like for the ads. Um, so bear that in mind when you're looking at stuff. You, know? you can also use Google Trends as well. Another way to check competition is literally just to look at the YouTube search engine results page. So here I've searched in best ballet songs to dance for. And looking here, we can see, you know, the average number of views and how well some of this is optimized and see this might be, you know, reasonably difficult, let's say medium difficulty, um, just because of the sheer amount of videos that already apply to this search, um, to the search term. Um, so we can see this is like a, a fairly, you know, high competition, not something that, you know, we couldn't get if we optimized towards, but something to keep in mind. Another way of checking competition is to use the site search function on Google. So when we type in site colon, and then the, the site we're looking for, and then a phrase, we can look on that site for that phrase. So here we're looking on YouTube for the phrase ballet music. And we can see, you know, if we have ballet music, that, that gives about 18,600 results. Ballet Music Or gives just four results. Four, because I made a mistake, would be 5,760 results. So the more results there are, the higher competition. That gives kind of like a good, a good metric there. Um, eventually, once you've done this research uh, and you've sort of looked at this um, and you found a keyword that you want to create a video for, um, 
it's time to create that video and then start optimizing. So we're gonna actually talk about some of the optimizations that you can make on YouTube. And before you even upload the video, the YouTube optimizations have begun. YouTube supposedly looks at the file name when ranking a video. As such, be purposeful when uploading the video. The one shown here is a really bad example, and it's how I name most of my files because I'm a chaotic, unorganized person. Um, but how I should be is this second version here. This is a really good example of a file name for a video. I mean, this is like a bad example if you're making a video about banana bread, but if you're making a video about Beethoven Symphony Number no. 5 full concert, this is a great file name, right? Make them relevant and put the focus keyword in the name or the file name of the video. You can also think about the video titles. This is one of the most important optimizations you can make. Ideally, your video titles should encourage click-through rate Remember how important that is for YouTube, right? Um, which means they should stand out on the YouTube SERP. You should also consider that the words you're putting into the title affect the ranking. Let's look at a few examples around the same subject, which is music school. Over the last few years, there's been an increase in the number of college themed videos. Uh, a big trend that we've seen is people reacting to college acceptance letters, which I guess is a strange phenomenon, but hey, people, want to watch what they want to watch. Here's a really good example of a video that's targeted to the phrase going to music school. Pardon me, school. Um, <clears throat> so while this is not like an exact match of the thing we've typed in at the top here, which is going to music school, um, it's a pretty close approximation, um, which is fine on YouTube. On, on YouTube. Uh, it's also using capitalization in a title case, which can help with making your vid title, video title stick out on the SERP. And also, interestingly, it uses brand names to catch your eye as well. Um, if, you know, if there's recognizable brand names, it makes sense to use them, right? All of the things being equal, YouTube's probably more likely to rank an exact match than a video title. So it's probably more likely to rank something that says going to music school. But because click-through rate is so important to that YouTube uh, search algorithm, you do have a little bit more space to play with here. This next one here uses an exact match here. So going to music school, you know, this is the phrase going to music school in. It also uses numbers and it has like an almost like clickbaity title, right? Using emotional language and offering slightly more clickbait focused titles can be a very strong tactic for YouTube SEO. You don't want to be like completely clickbaity, clickbaity. Um, you know, you want to actually deliver on the things you're promising the video. If that doesn't happen, if you if you start a video and it doesn't, you know, start with the four things I wish I'd consider before going to music school, then people are going to stop watching and it's going to hit that really important metric of total watch time or audience retention. And YouTube's going to really punish your video for that. So, you know, you can afford to be a little clickbaity, but don't be like, don't go full like clickbaity, if that makes sense. Uh, use emotional language is a better way to put it. Capitalization here is really important, right? The and is capitalized. Um, again, with YouTube, you have a little more room to sort of play with that emotional language and capitalization. Um, you'll also notice that all of the examples I've put here are of a similar length. Um, this is to avoid being cut off. Um, so if it was too long, YouTube would cut that off. And generally, this affects click through rate. Um, you want to keep it under around 65 characters. Let's also talk about video descriptions. Video descriptions are some of the most underutilized aspects of SEO, in my opinion. On the YouTube SERP, only the first 125 characters are actually displayed. So make sure you're writing your video description with this in mind. Create variations of your keyword, write with click-through rate at, 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 at the forefront. Um, here I've searched for the phrase yoga for beginners. Some of you are probably familiar with yoga from Adrian. Uh, she is an excellent yoga teacher, can help even the most inflexible wooden plank like myself. Um, but she also has a knack for optimizing her YouTube channel as well, which is part of the reason of her success. 
Look at how this description is designed in a way that makes you want to click through. It's like an SEM ad, right? All levels, beginners, and even a call to action. Hop on the mat and start. We also want to think about above the fold. Oh, there you go. That's highlights that. We also want to think about above the fold and below the fold in videos. So, you know, you can use a fair amount of space in your video descriptions. I think it's like about 200 words. It might be done on characters, but it, it equals out to around 200 words. So we can sort of get creative. Here you can see above the fold on this yoga for, for beginners, we have all of the relevant information for this video. Just underneath that, we have hashtags, which actually appear at the top of the video. Generally, don't use more than five of these, but they can be a good way to make it stand out. After that, we've got, you know, general descriptions about the channel and her messaging. So subscribe to the channel, some of her social uh, stuff here, some more websites, as well as some like legal stuff. Um, it's a really strong uh, description. Um, this is a full concert from the New, jo New Jersey Symphony Orchestra, who we worked with with some uh, SEO for YouTube. Um, they have a really excellent video description here. And one of the really cool things about this is that you can use it to jump to different parts in the video. Um, having usable descriptions is really strong. And Google can actually pull that information and use it um, on their own search engine results page as well. Um, Again, more hashtags here as well, which can lead you to other places and social stuff. There's also optimizations you can make to the thumbnail of a video, which is the picture associated with the video that you're going to play. It's worth mentioning that you can only upload custom thumbnails if you have a verified account. Custom thumbnails can make a huge impact on how you catch a viewer's eye. Thumbnails like video titles and descriptions should be designed to increase click-through rate while accurately describing what is in the video. Use relevant, visually stunning photos with a limited amount of relative text. Uh, sorry, relevant text. Think about who's looking for your videos and what they're searching for, and then use that in the thumbnail. 90% of top performing videos on YouTube have custom thumbnails. So it's really worth using them. And think about your brand. Branding is something we mentioned before. You know, while we're focusing on non-branded search, a strong brand can help your organization stand out on the SERP. Look at the Kennedy Center logo, which appears in the bottom left of every single one of their videos alongside specific font. Uh, people who are familiar with this videos are then gonna be more likely to click through. Um, for example, if I'm searching for Ray Chen, the violinist here, we can see that this video really sticks out because I recognize that branding. And branding doesn't actually need to be as obvious as that as well. One of the first places I look when seeking out a recipe on YouTube um, is users like Bon Appetit, Babish, and Chef John. Um, here's an example of really strong branding from Babish. Here, I instantly want to click on the middle because I'm familiar with his branding. Um, he has consistent branding across all of his different series, which makes it really like recognizable. And it isn't like a huge logo or like wacky branding or super like out there, like thumbnails, but it's consistent and it's clear, very strong. Also, if it's appropriate to do so, consider featuring a face. YouTube is known for being a place to creators where people speak to the audience. Um, so, you know, if you can have a video in which you can place a uh, face, then that's a really strong tactic, along with text in the thumbnail. Speaking of text, trying to be clear and add text that encourages people to click through. Tell with my past obsession, I'm currently learning Italian, another one of my obsessions. And then once again, one of the first places I went to learn was YouTube. Be appealing, but don't clickbait, right? Use emotional language. Um, but I doubt you can learn Italian in four hours. Uh, but I certainly can't because I've been trying for like 50 days now. Um, let's talk about tags. So tags are less important than they used to be for YouTube SEO as the algorithm looks at several other factors, but tags can help users find your videos. So use it, use them properly and keep it simple. It can especially help with the sidebar of like the related users, that bit of the search end of, of, the, um, of the YouTube interface.
make sure you're adding phrases and only add like full phrase tags, right? If we have a video about the play Cat on a Hot Tim Roof, we'd want to add the entire play. An example on the left here, we're actually saying to YouTube that our video is relevant to tin and cat and roof, um, which is kind of not, right? It's relevant to cat on a hot tin roof. Um, so keep that in mind. You have up to 500 characters to use here, but don't feel like you have to use up all of the space. Once you have good coverage that describes your video well, stop using it. You know, it's better to have it's better to have good coverage. Um, it's better to like have like good coverage and less than it is to add irrelevant tags. If ever you're stuck for in uh, for inspiration, you can look actually look at the tags on other competitors' uh, videos. So here we have a video that's like a walkthrough of the Natural History Museum in DC. Um, you know, the tags aren't anywhere on this actual page. So what we can do is look at the page source. Uh, and when we look at the keywords inside this, uh, it's a special meta tag, which YouTube adds, which actually just is taken from the tags section of uh, where you upload a video. So we can take this information. I'll just separate this out so we can see it here. Um, and we can look at the tags that a video has. Uh, this is actually kind of a useful thing for keyword inspiration as well, because if you know that a competitor is already using these tags, then you know you can use this to inspire new content. Of course, this is getting quite heavy and like dry, especially with all the coding stuff. So here is another picture of Barney. Um, this is my favorite photo of him. He looks adorable there. Uh, can't wait to meet him. Um, we also need to talk about accessibility. Um, accessibility helps organic search. Subtitles, transcripts, and closed captions are becoming more and more important in video optimization across the web, and for good reason. 20% of the population in the US has some form of hearing loss. YouTube provides automatic closed captions. They aren't always great, okay? So some users believe that adding correct captions can manually, correct captions manually can increase the interaction rate and ranking of a video. If there's enough space, transcripts can even be added to the video description to bulk out the length. This is a valid use of that video description and can increase keyword coverage. Let's also talk a little bit about content. I think content is going to vary widely for everyone here. So, you know, let's just say content needs to be good, right? You're designing this content not for the YouTube algorithm, but for actual people. Think about longer videos. In general, YouTube wants to keep people from watching for as long as possible. So it makes sense that they, the videos that we have are, are longer. You know, YouTube is trending towards these long videos. Uh, I'm not afraid to admit it. You know, back at the start of the pandemic, I fell into the sourdough uh, sort of um, uh, sort of like buzz. Um, I'm, you know, I had a starter called Yeast Lightning. Um, and a fun fact, there's actually a 458% increase in daily views of videos about making sourdough bread around this time. Um, but yeah, the first place I went was YouTube. Uh, look at all these guides we make this search. They're all sort of like 10, 12, 18, nine minutes longer. They're, you know, they're, they're, they're verging on like around 10 minutes and over. And that's not to say videos shouldn't be this long. Think about the intent behind a video, right? Um, this is something that's slightly simpler than making a perfectly crusty sourdough loaf, right? Is tying a bow tie. Most people will be looking at these, these videos, bow tie in hand um, and the clock ticking. You know, the intent behind this video is to quickly get that bow tie on. We need it on and out, otherwise we'll be late to the wedding. So think about the search intent behind your video. Saying the keyword in the first part of a video is actually a really useful optimization and something that a lot of YouTubers recommend. So here, because I've searched for this how to make sourdough bread, um, in the first 10 seconds of this video, the narrator slash host has said the key phrase, how to make some sourdough bread. Interactions are also very, very important. Have you ever heard something like this in a YouTube video? Like and subscribe. Tell me what kind of pizza topping you are in the comments. Uh, also, please do tell me what kind of pizza topping you are in the comments. Uh, this is a super common phrase on YouTube, um, especially you know, especially the words like and subscribe. This is because interaction is a key metric uh, in how people interact with the video, uh, how YouTube ranks the video. 
likes, subscribes, shares and stuff really do help with ranking. Also, sorry, there's so much food in this um, presentation. I think I planned this before lunch um, at, some t at some point. Uh, and so food just sort of like made its way in there. Um, yeah. Let's talk briefly about how you organize the content that you have. And playlists. Playlists are a fantastic way of raising that key metric of total time watched or session time. Think about it. If you have a list of related videos, users are more likely to either let it keep running, meaning more ad money for YouTube, which they love, um, or, click, or click through to other related videos, which again, they love. Um, when creating play playlists, think about the intent of a playlist. What is someone looking for? What's the intent behind the search? And what's that implicit question? Um, don't link together videos if they aren't really that related. Um, this playlist from The Guardian is a great way of organizing content. I just searched for best Shakespeare monologue, and they've had this video of like Shakespeare solos. Um, all of these are very related um, videos, so it makes sense that they're all in the same in the same playlist. And playlists aren't just a way of orga organizing on your channel, right? They can affect your organic search performance on YouTube as well. Sometimes a single video isn't as powerful as a playlist of videos uh, that really um, that really speak to an intent. Let's also talk about your channel. This is kind of like your homepage of YouTube. So we need to make sure you're being intentional. Um, here's a really strong homepage. Crash Course is one of my favorite channels of all time. It essentially gives little summaries of a bunch of different subjects from philosophy to biochemistry to black American history. They're constantly uploading new courses. And the channel page is really well optimized. Their brand is everywhere. Let's start at the top with this banner. Um, it gives a really strong, fun overview of what the channel is all about. After that, we have the trailer. Um, be strategic here. Right? Think about the people that are coming to your page for the first time. Do they want to see a full performance of a real deep cut in your repertoire? Probably not, right? A trailer is a perfect thing to put here, whether it's for the season, organization as a whole, or just a branded piece. After that, Crash Courses organize their content into relevant sections. Uh, so the um, different things that they're currently uploading, the courses that are being released each week, as well as their back history of um, the back catalog of all of the different popular um, courses. You know, all of their most popular videos and playlists are going to be at the top. Their about page is descriptive. It's about their organization. Uh, they don't have any channels, I don't think. They do have a store on there, which is linked up there, and a way you can interact with the community, as well as a full list of playlists. It's a really well-optimized YouTube channel. And while we're thinking about YouTube, you know, we also want to be maximizing the YouTube assets that we have. You know, if you're uploading a video, how can you get the most out of that? Squeeze the most SEO juice out of it, if you will. I think one of the best ways of content creation does not actually involve creating any new content. Uh, I realize this sounds like some sort of mad riddle um, that someone tells you before crossing a bridge, but you know what I basically mean is you've already created these YouTube videos, so make sure you are you know using it to your advantage by thinking about Google as well. Google pulls um, videos from YouTube to display on the SERP, the search engine results page. Um, so, you know, even by, uplo by uploading stuff onto YouTube, you're already leaning into the Google search algorithm as well. But we can also think about your actual website. If you upload every video you have onto a separate page of your website, um, either by an automatic like embedding thing or just manually uploading them, um, you are and like formatting that in like a blog that can be put somewhere. You're maximizing those assets that you've already got, um, and then you can do stuff like optimizing the title tags here and the meta descriptions, which can influence how you rank and appear on the search engine results page. Just a reminder here, the title tag is the bit of code that Google takes to create this clickable link. So here, um, this is on the balletmet.org site. Uh, they've got a page that ranks for virtual ballet performances. And in a title tag, they've got the phrase virtual ballet performances that helps with ranking. You now the words you put in there matter where, 
will affect where Google places you on the search engine results page. So put the name of the video in that search, in that title tag. It also affects click-through rates. Uh, someone searching virtual ballet performances is more likely to click through uh, onto that page. The meta description um, is an accurate description of what you're going to find on the site. Um, and while it doesn't affect ranking, it does affect click-through rate. So write with click-through rate in mind um, while still you know, accurately describing what's on the page. Google is a place where you can't afford to be clickbaity. They'll punish you for that sort of language. Um, technical SEO warning, you know, I'm going to have a little picture of Barney, the puppy. Here he is on the moors. Um, my dad and his partner taking him for a walk. Um, yeah, can't wait to meet that dog. I'm very, very, very excited. Um, so, yeah, let's talk about some of the takeaways, hopefully, that we had today. Um, Hopefully by now you realize that YouTube search bar is your new best friend. So often we get asked about, should we optimize for Bing or Yahoo alongside Google? Um, and what I'll say is, you know, most of the time you're optimizing for Google, you're actually already optimizing for Bing and Yahoo, you know? They, Google has like roughly 90% of that search engine, um, that web search engine uh, traffic. Um, and so Bing and Yahoo and Yandex, uh, which is a Russian search engine, they all have to follow the example of Google. So actually the next best thing you can do with SEO is to start thinking about YouTube alongside Google and making use of the US's second largest search engine. This starts with keyword research. If we want to think of YouTube as a search engine, we need to research what people are searching for using autocompletes, things like the Keyword Planner, tools like Answer the Public can really help with seeing what people are looking for. So we can give them the answer in a video. This is a win-win for us, right? And it's a win for YouTube's business model as well. You can't just upload a video and hope for the best. Think about all the optimizations that you can make. You know, the file name before you even upload the video, the video title, the video description, tags, thumbnails, uh, the, the um, closed captions that you can add. All of these really affect how Google's gonna place you on the search engine, on the YouTube search engine results page and how people are gonna click through and interact with your video as well. So be specific, be intentional behind these optimizations. Organize the content that you already have. Think about how content works together. If you have very similar videos that make sense in a playlist, then group them all together. If that playlist is super popular, place it high on the, on the YouTube um, channel that you have. Um, think about your channel with fresh eyes. Someone coming to it for the first time, what are they thinking? Are they, you know, are you, have you got like a real deep cut on the, as a trailer? Or have you got something that introduces the organization? And finally, don't forget about Google. By uploading each of your videos to a separate page on your site, uh, then Google will rank all of these pages and display them for relevant search terms. And by doing this, you're optimizing uh, you're, you're optimizing and you're helping with the ranking and you're getting even more out of your content. Uh, I really hope this has been useful. Um, and, you know, I think we have time for some questions. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much, Dan. That was so strong. You started with us salivating for pasta. Now we're salivating <laughs> for SEO. People want you to have your own show in the chat. It's blowing up. It's great. So thank you. Thank you so much. It was so strong. Um, we definitely have a handful of questions. So I want to make sure we can get through as much, uh, as many of them as possible. So there were a couple of questions that came up related to just the relationship between YouTube Premium and then just thinking about YouTube in general for YouTube. And then I know in the beginning of the presentation, you had touched on this idea of advertising versus SEO, SEM versus SEO, and how all of that is sort of joined and not joined in the topics that you discussed. Mm -hmm. So can we start by just zooming out a little bit and talking about all of these keyword optimizations and things like that, that you touched on and how that relates to the advertising piece 
and then how that relates to some of these organic search results and perhaps give people some solace in what they can do, even if someone is a YouTube premium user and not receiving the advertising, how can they still get solace from some of the things that you shared today? Yeah, exactly. So um, the ads are how YouTube makes their money, right? And most of the work we are doing in terms of, in terms of um, like targeting and those sort of videos is with advertising videos. You know, we're, we're paying money to appear on other people's videos. This is the organic sort of stuff that helps Google make that money, right? Um, this is, we're talking about these, these things that appear without, like, this is what people are using YouTube for. Um, so by optimizing towards this, you're not really paying any money to appear on YouTube, right? You're just playing with YouTube's, uh, playing well with YouTube's um, sort of like business model. People are coming here for the bit, for the content that hopefully you are creating and they're getting the ads beforehand. That's the price they're paying for seeing the videos um, that you are hopefully putting up there. So that's why we want to think about keyword research first and what people are, um, what people, you know, are actually searching in because we're answering it, right? We're, we're, we're providing a service with these videos um, for YouTube to use. Um, so, yeah. That's great. Thank you. I think that's really, really good framing. And I know there were just some questions about, you know, the concern of not being able to reach YouTube premium users with the ads. And I think this entire presentation really reinforces how to still hack the system, how to still use the platform to your benefit and still um, be searchable and findable on YouTube in that way. So that's great. Thank you mm -hmm. for that. Um, we had a question here about engagement baiting. I know you had touched on the fact that Google can sometimes punish for this engagement baiting sort of um, language. Please like and comment and things like that. Uh, and I know you had spoken to how that shows up on YouTube. Are there any sort of best practices around that? Is there any sort of punishment coming from the algorithm specifically on YouTube for that? Or is it still a common practice that that is something that we can lean into in terms of optimizing videos on YouTube? Yeah, as far as I understand, it's still a very common, it's a, it's a common practice. Um, one of the key metrics that YouTube uses is how people are interacting with it by either liking, subscribing, sharing, uh, clicking through to other videos that are on the page at the end. Um, so, you know, most YouTubers have something which is like, you know, tell me what kind of pizza topping you are. It's a silly example, but there are like people who do still use this tactic. Um, in terms of being clickbaity, the thing you want to avoid is not delivering or like um, stalling on the content that you are going to mm -hmm. give, right? So if you have that in an example, four things I wish I'd known before going to college, um, like music college, that example I used before, like if you don't give those four things or like right at the start of the video, you're talking about a bunch of other stuff for a while, people are going to click off. Um, what does that mean? That that means that key metric that Google is optimizing towards is suddenly way shorter. So Google's going to like YouTube's going to be like, ooh, uh, not place your video high on the search engine results page um, for like a search term associated with that. So you yeah. really just want to deliver. You know, you have, um, I, I guess I, I, I played it a little coy when I was like saying like you can be a clickbaity, but not too clickbaity. Like it, that's, but that's kind of like, that is kind of like yeah. the vibe really, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Makes sense. Um, so related to some of the keyword research that you were talking about, mm. can you just speak to, um, I think there's, there's a question around the specificity of it and a mm -hmm. question around the volume of it. I think as you're going through keyword research, it's easy to, question how specific you should get, how broad you should go. And I know you talked a little bit about this balance of competition and volume. Um, and then also just the number of keywords that you want to go after as you're, you're thinking about your descriptions and titles and things like that. Um, can you share a little bit more around that in terms of the specificity or just some questions or lenses that uh, our attendees can use as they're going through the keyword research? Yeah. Um... So I guess with that balance, there's almost like a third factor with like, as like, how much time do you have to be this specific, right? Because if, um, you know, if you're having like, let's say about like the pasta one, for example, do you want to make a, a single video for every single type of pasta for every single type of region? Like, do you want to make one that's like 
spinach garganelli, you know, uh, squid ink garganelli, like regular egg ar ar garganelli, semolina ar ar garganelli. Like that feels too specific, right? And the search volume for those are probably not not worth a like the the won't be enough to be like merit going after and be like the time you have to create all those videos is is it's limited right you have to we've all we've all got limited resources so mm -hmm. balancing that to have one that's just on how to make garganelli and having all those different versions mentioned in is a good example mm. another thing i'll say is like create uh, when you're going for a keyword uh think about like your main focus keyword so in some of those like college ones i was i was saying before like you know, going to going to college, uh, like going to music school, for example, that's kind of the keyword focus there. We're, we're, when we keep that in mind and create the video on that focus keyword, and then in the description, just write normally like it's a like it's a description that you're actually describing it while thinking about click through rate. Generally, you're gonna hit enough keywords to make it valuable. So, um, I'd say you know. Focus on one main focus one. This is actually the same um, recommendation we do with SEO for Google as well. It's like, what's the main thing you wanna you wanna get? Um, if, is it like, you know, the top five ballets ever, or most fam famous, the most famous five most famous ballets? Um, is that the keyword you're kind of going for? Is most famous ballets? Then yeah, but even like best ballets or most famous classic ballets and sort of, you know, Google's going to kind of catch that if you have good enough content. So don't worry too much about it. Yeah, that's great. And then related to um, YouTube tags, there was a question that came up on this. I think this was the section where you used Cat on a Hot Tin Roof as mm. an example. Um, so I know you spoke to relevancy. Do you have any sort of recommendations around the number of tags or any sort of goal there? Or would you just say relevancy is the main lens? Yeah, it's uh, it's relevancy is is the main one. Um, again, this is like such a coy answer of like enough. Um, but it's like um, like uh, what I would say is you know, let's say you should have the name of what you're doing. So in the cat of the hot tin roof, you'd have cat of hot tin roof. Um, then you'd have the playwright, the um, the company that you that you are like the theater it's at. So you have a branded. Um, tag in there as well as well as like full play recording like full recording of of plays in um like atlanta georgia wherever they're say being performed right so you want enough coverage to go go farther but but like for example writing is or like playwriting is you know kind of related to it right but it's not really what the video is about right if you're watching a full recording of cat in a hot tin roof the tag playwriting isn't super relevant. Um, so think about, you know, if someone searched for the tag and you popped up, would they be really disappointed? Because uh, if that's the case, then don't add it. Um, yeah, that yeah. makes sense. 10, yeah. why not 10? <laughs> no, enough, yeah. <laughs> that's great. Um, Awesome. So I want to I want to end the Q and A with just a, a moment to zoom out. Now, of course, um, we CI are here to help clients as they want to embark on their SEO journey, and certainly we hope that everyone's able to do that. Um, but for those who can't do that right away, or who are sort of at the beginning of their journey, you covered a ton of different topics today, and so I'm curious if you can leave our attendees with um, just a sense of prioritization. If there were one or two things that people could go back to their desks and try next week in the next month mm -hmm. um what would you recommend from that perspective just to get people started and get that palette warm totally like seo can be so extensive and it can seem so overwhelming um especially if someone you know talking fast at you for like 53 minutes like that can it can feel like so much but just by hitting a few like main things and making a start, you can actually start to make an impact. I think a lot of the time with SEO, people get discouraged because it's so like, well, where do I start and where do I end with this? Like, but just like start to think about the about the search algorithm when you're writing your video titles, for example, or go back and edit. I think you can edit video titles. Go back and edit the video titles that you already have to just like rethink some of that search volume, search stuff. Like if you have for example, a full concert and it's cool and it's all about 
it's all to do with Mozart, but it doesn't have Mozart in that title tag. Start with that. Start with that one little tiny thing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, start optimizing and doing a little bit um, and don't be afraid. You're not going to break anything. So. Yeah, that's yeah. great. I love that iterative approach. That's mm. awesome. Well, thank you so much, Dan. This was so great. If you ever want to have your own show, you will have plenty <laughs> of people who want to watch it. Thank you so much for doing this. And um, we'll see you on the next session, everybody. Hello everyone. Again, my name is Akua Noni Parker and welcome to our third stretch session. So I decided to do a little bit on the floor. Many of the stretches will be similar to the one standing, but you might be able to see a little difference. Maybe stretching on the floor might be better for you and so you'll learn some new things for yourself and your body. So we will start with our legs out. You can have them relaxed if you'd like, or you can have them engaged, totally up to you. And we'll start by rounding our back. Remember when we rounded our back and we pushed forward, like someone was pulling behind, we're pushing forward. And then we'll press the arms again and our chest raises diagonally forward. And we'll round the back again. You want to feel like your two sit bones are evenly into the ground. And come up and push the arms back, reach, back, push, push, push. Let's do three more like this, rounding, like someone's pulling you back, but you're pushing and reaching forward. And reaching forward. And Two more times, rounding. And press. Last time, rounding. And press. Good. Let's get those muscles engaged a little bit. So this time we're going to do a similar stretch that we did when we went to the side. So you can use your hands to really help you find your sits bones. The same way we had three points of our feet into the ground, now we're working and we're pretending like our sits bones are the points of our feet and we're sitting into the ground. So let's take the right arm out and up like we did before and you'll bend the left elbow and reaching over and feel that nice long stretch up and over. Again, the left hip is already sort of rooting down into the ground as you lower the right elbow. That's a great stretch. I think I feel it better on the floor. Reaching up and right hip roots down as the left elbow lowers. Remember someone's pulling this hand, so you're reaching and up last time wide reaching like half of the rainbow left sit bone into the ground and up now just to get a little bit lower we'll make our way to our right side and you can have this foot here for support if you want and we're just gonna lay down so what you want to do is slowly walk yourself up, slowly to a sitting position, like you're sitting on that hip, and you'll feel sort of the same stretch that you did when we did the kickstand stretch. And then just easily walk yourself back down, sliding down. We'll do two more, walking up, up, up. Use your hands to help you up, and lower down. Last time. Really use your hands if you need. You want to try and get as high as possible 
so that you can get the stretch around the hip. And since we're up, we'll just swing our legs to the other side. And the right leg helps us in the front if you need, and we'll lower down. So we'll slowly walk up. And walking down. And up. And down. Really use your arms to help you if you need. Last time, up. And we'll stay up. Now we're gonna make our way to our stomachs and we're going to work our backs even though we're laying on our stomach, right? So I'm going to face the side. And what you're gonna do is place your hands one on top of the other and place your forehead on the ground. Now, your arm of choice, slide that arm out and just lift long like you're reaching out your fingertips and lay the hand down and replace it under your head. And do the opposite side, reaching out. Reaching that middle finger out long, lifting the hand off the floor. And lower. And bring it back in. We'll do this a few times just so you can really see how it engages your back. And lower, and down. The other side, sliding out, and lift, reaching long though, and lower, and down. Let's do two more times. Reaching out, other side. Reach out, 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 lower. And down last time, reaching, sliding the hand out, reaching the middle finger long and lower and down. Now we're already here, so we're going to work our legs. So again, we're resting our hands on our forehead, we're on our stomachs, and I'm gonna lift my right leg. I want to sort of go out towards the, the wall below me and then lift, yes? So almost like I'm gonna shift and stand on that wall and then lift my leg, just hover a little bit and lower. That's it. Reaching that foot to the wall below me and lifting, hover, hover, and lower. Let's do this four more times. Reaching out long, it engages the core. Lifting the leg, reaching still, and lower. Reaching the leg long, and hover. Down, two more times. Reaching out, hover, and down. Reaching and hover and down. Good. Pushing your way back. And if you can be careful of your knees and just now rounding your back, rounding forward. If you need to support yourself with your hands, rounding your back. Just relax there for a second. Remember your opposition. Yes, I can support myself with my core, but I can also feel like something's pulling me this way and I might be pulling in opposite direction. And our legs to the front. Making sure again those sits bones are rooted into the ground. We'll reach our arms out long, 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 long. Palms face, dropping the elbows and the wrists and the hands and place them down and see if you can press up, 
Lift your body up a little bit. Your sits bones just hover over the floor and down and reach the arms out. Long and palms face. Dropping the elbows, the wrists and the hands and lower. Bring them in and push, reaching up. Reaching with your chest up, sits bones down, pushing up. Last time, this time we're going to reach out, palms face, and we can go forward, just round the back, just round the back. If you can't touch your toes, it's fine. Just reach for them by rounding the back. And come up. Thank you so much for stretching with me in these three sessions. I hope you've learned something that you can take home and use sometime in between the day. You can find me on Instagram at onlyupward as well as at underscore coos underscore kitchen. That's at underscore K-U-S underscore kitchen, K-I-T-C-H-E-N. It's been a pleasure and I hope you feel great in your body.